This is coverage of the 1980 National Farmers Organization Convention in Cincinnati, Ohio. Coverage of the Sheep and Feeder Cattle Division. And now, here's Dick Hammond, Director of the Sheep Division. The health of our sheep. It's in the health of our, pro of our production, being able to market it and sell them and bargain it. That's where the real sickness is. So all the emphasis when you go to one of these meetings, now remember this, as any of you that are going to the National Cattlemen's Meeting, going to the National Lamb Feeders Meeting, whatever, you are going to see people are going to talk about uh, credit. They're going to talk about uh, uh, Here's uh, DVM, 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 PhD in, in economics, uh, DVM, uh, DVM. Uh, here's a fellow that's a, an auctioneer. Here's a DVM, uh, PhD in, uh, uh, in ad animal husbandry. So we're going to talk about production. This is where the action is as far as the education in the United States is concerned to the American farmer and the future of this country is concerned. It is the same as it's been for quite some time, and that's for you to go home, produce more, and do it cheaper. And that's just, you just might as well accept it. That's just the way it is. Now, I'm not a, uh, I'm gonna get this over a little bit more. I'm not a, I am a sheep man. I'm not one of these fellows that have, have had this, this type of schooling. I totally come from a different direction. I talk from a different vantage point. I am a sheep man, and I'm a professional marketer and bargainer. I have been for over 30 years. Now, in this talk that we're going to have today is I'm not trying to sell anything to any of you people. That's not my point here. My point is to make you aware so that you folks can draw your own conclusions of what an NFO program and what a marketing program can do for you. About the only thing that you need in this meeting is an open mind. Now, if you've come in here with a fixed conclusion that everything is all you know, that you've got all the answers that nobody else in this room can add to, then I would really seriously suggest just get up and, 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 and probably go to another meeting or something. Because when you've become too old to learn, you've become too old. And I can say that very, very definitely. I'm 51 years old, and I have never had a greater growth period in my learning experience than this last year. I don't know how many of you had a chance to watch the epic centennial, but it, was a, uh, it hit me right in the gut because these farmers were sitting there, and the wind was blowing like hell in Colorado, and they were trying to hold their ground down on the, on the, on the, on the ground and blowing away and they were resisting the change of a man that said, let's plow our furrows a different direction. And they resisted, and they fought it, and they almost went broke. And then they finally said, we haven't anything else to do, so we're going to make that change. Unfortunately, that's a human trait, and unfortunately, NFO has to suffer with that same trait. Remember one thing, when you talk to your friends and neighbors, there's nothing wrong with you. The only problem with NFO is it's been ahead of its time. We're trying to explain electricity to people in 1860 that have got 1860 ideas. The problem with the American farmer is he's uncomfortable with new ideas. He's just, not just American farmer, anybody's uncomfortable with the new idea. So they have a problem. And it's up to us to come to these conventions to try to some way, shape, or form to go back home Pick up what we can use. You're going to hear a whole lot in this, in this convention, and there's going to be some that you're going to sit in the back row and say, baloney. And yet there's going to be a whole lot that you're going to say, hey, that's not a bad idea. And you're going to take that multi-million dollar computer that, you, that we call a mine and go home, modify that and bring it up and pass it on to your neighbor, and he in turn say, hey, that's a good idea, and he's going to improve on it. That's what these conventions are all about, exchanging ideas and having an opportunity to be aware of what is going on. 
The NFO has a program that will fit particularly the sheep. I'm making this combination on this first go around, but particularly our, on our, and it has on the feeder cattle. Now, we came a full cycle in NFO. I mean, we came to NFO and we, we went out and said, look, we've got the idea. We have electricity. We can make a motor run. We can do this work for you. And the guy that's standing out there in the middle of the field behind a plow horse says, what the hell's a motor? Let alone the electricity. That's what we're up against. We've come the full cycle. We had everybody join early, a lot of enthusiasm, and then we had the problems that set in when you begin to grow. And with all growth, remember, folks, I don't care who you are, and mothers will, can tell you most of all, that there is no growth, real growth, without pain. <coughs> and the people I'm speaking today, I'm sure, have had been through the painful experience of trying to assist their neighbors. The problem with this is the same as it was in Centennial. You can go do the right job on your land, but if the guy next door to you doesn't, it blows his field away and takes yours with it. It's a communicable disease. It's too bad that NFO can't just sit in their own little, little module hut and say, we're going to be the survivors. We're going to survive this Holocaust. We're not. We can't survive it without our neighbors. So that means it's just as important for, as it is for you to understand, it's just as important for your neighbor to understand. Now the question that we've got to ask at this convention and ask in this meeting is what can we do to get more, of a, more bargaining power? And the question is easy, it's volume. And why haven't we had this volume? I've got programs that are running all the time, and I think very successfully. I have sheep today, a single truckload, $6,000 over the market. I haven't had my phone ring once and say, hey, Hammond, I think you did a good job. I think NFO is really working. But let there be a discount on one buck lamb. Oh, my. So you see... We're directed in the wrong direction in some ways. We're watching that buck lamb, and we're not thinking about this, that we're going to lose a dollar or two on, and we're going to have a telephone call over that, or a slip wool, or a crippled lamb, or something of this nature. But we're going to forget that we're sitting here putting into the marketplace today s lambs at $6,000 a load higher than they should be over the market. And I say should be higher than the market affords today. California was a beautiful example. Last year I went out there. Land market was 75 cents. No one wanted to talk to me. Nice fella. NFO's okay. Three weeks later, oh, did we have a terrible thing happen here in the United States. Everybody had intestinal problems. They quit eating lamb. Three weeks' time, we had a lamb market under 50%, under 50 cents. The night I went into Bakersfield, California, a man just got his returns at 45 cents. In three weeks' time, we've talked about from 75 to 45 cents. Now the puzzle makes sense, doesn't it? All that beautiful production. What would that guy thought if he walked out into his feedlot or into his ranch and farm and saw 30% of his livestock dead? He'd been in shock. We'd had a visit even in the hospital. But being used to up and downs of markets, he puts his hands in his pockets and says, boy, tough year. His banker didn't say that. You remember one thing, and this particularly for NFO, the only people who make mistakes, who don't make mistakes, are people that never do anything. And I'm sure we're not guilty of this. Now, my approach to this is a no-nonsense thing. I'm not going to stand up here and give you a lot of rhetoric and then wave flags and play the horns and cymbals. I'll leave that for the political end of this machine. But I'll tell you one thing, I'm here to take a hardline approach to what we're going to have to do to make this bird fly. And the first question I have to ask you, and when I ask you, I want, to be, I want you to be thinking, I want you to be thinking the same way of asking, sitting down, not a hardline situation where we're going to take on our neighbors and show them how damn dumb they are. It's when I ask you, are you comfortable with the marketing system that you have today? Now I'm going to slip into my sheep situation. Are you comfortable with the sheep situation you have today? Do you really feel 
that we're doing a good job, and I can, think, I can say that about all the commodities. Are we getting what we need? Uh, are we comfortable? Are we happy? If we're happy, then we're wasting our time at this meeting. I can't believe there's anybody sitting in this meeting that's happy with what's happening to him and his farm economics. Now, we got a full program in sheep. We're fat lambs. I'm going to leave mo all the mechanics so that you cattlemen are not going to be bored with the sheepmen talk. The mechanics of the sheep division will be out there in that booth with two competent men to be able to answer your questions. But we do have a full program, feeder lambs, fat lambs, wool, replacement ewes. Now some people say, and many of you will, just, you know, who is this guy that stands up there and wants to take up our time and talk to us? Just a brief rundown. I've got 33 years in marketing and livestock, bargaining and feeding, slaughter operations. I was the youngest member of the Omaha Livestock Exchange at 19 years old. At 15 years on the world, uh, marketing and bargaining on the world's largest livestock market. 13 head years as head lamb buyer of five to 600,000 lambs per year. A supervisor of feeding operations of 100,000 lambs per year a general manager for a major packer with over $25 million gross, five years director of the sheep program for the National Farmers Organization. What does that mean? Supervising existing sheep programs, initiating and implementation of new programs, chief negotiator and bargainer for sheep programs, chief administ administrator of forward contracts, live sheep deliveries, administration and accounting. What it means is the buck stops here. You're not going to call Corning and have to look around for 49 people to find out what's wrong with the sheep division. You call Dick Hammond. And if there's something wrong, we're going to find out what it is, and we're going to see that it doesn't happen again. And if it isn't wrong, we're going to explain to your satisfaction why we're doing it and what we're doing it for. Net result is that I represent the largest single grower, grower-orientated lamb block in the United States and also have the privilege of directing the only nationwide lamb sheep program in the United States. Well, you look at this crowd, and I'm sure probably three quarters of you are cattlemen, and yet a very few people in the United States has put Dick Hammond in this position. It isn't Dick Hammond putting me in this position. It's a, this organization and the people that are behind it. So when you think, when you look at that and you digest that, Here's this organization with, this, with, a, with people that are trying to do something that have created the largest single land block in the United States and also the only nationwide collective bargaining for sheep and lambs in the United States. Now, one of the reasons we had to do this, and you people in the cattle industry as well relate to this, due to the drastic decline of buyer competition over the past years, it is increasingly self-evident that growers are at a distinct disadvantage in attempting to market their livestock production. The main factors causing this situation is the centralization of buyer competition. And that, people, is a big item. They just did one on uh, Charles Kowalt, just did one on Texas in the sheep industry. It's further complicated by the fragmentation. You people are split up. We're getting farther and farther apart. We used to have, uh, in particular in the sheep business, we had whole communities, whole towns that were sheep people. We don't have them. We got two, three families left, and the rest of the 10 or 15 families are, are scattered in some other deal. Families are breaking up and going into, uh, going into town. So we don't have that cohesion in the country that we had before. Can you turn the mic off? Can you pull back? Okay. I don't even know where this thing. T okay, is it better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, forcing growers into a very inequitable bargaining position. I mean, you have little or no professional help. What makes you folks have an opportunity to think? How many people of you would go out here and jump in an airplane and try to fly it if you've ever had any training? And yet we take marketing just as for granted as that. Market information presently available is limited and unable to give a complete report due to it is mainly buyer-orientated. 
Unfortunately, by the time this limited information reaches the majority of growers, it is past history. And why is it buyer orientated? Simple reason. The people that are reporters, most of them have eight to five jobs. They can find Mr. Owens. He's, got, he's, a, he's a man with a telephone in his ear, just like me. He's easy to find. Not you. You're out mending fence. You're out chasing a stray cow or looking for a stray lamb. Consequently, who gives the ch information input? The buyer. You hear the buyer's side. Now, I don't say that man is lying. I don't say he's giving false information. I'm just saying he's giving his side of the picture, and you only get one side. So that means you've got one idea, his. And this is what you basically make your market decisions on. What do you do today? Well, how many of you people, what, what, what graph in your mind or what your neighbors use? They turn on the radio. They basically get a general idea, and that's what they base their ideas on. I'm glad that I'm not flying with you, and you have a general idea that airplanes fly, and that's about it. Because that's just about the way we're operating our farms and ranches at this moment in time. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, <clears throat> here's market news. Omaha session, mid-session, 319. This is last year. Steady. This is government report now. Steady to $7 lower. I imagine you people ought to make a tremendous decision on marketing on a, a report as steady to $7 lower. That ought to really. We're working, we're looking for quarters. You know, we, we're, we're hollering about checkoff. <laughs> we turn around and look at steady to $7 lower. Here's another situation. Spring lambs, 100, 110, 67, 69, mostly 68 to 68 and a half. Few at 65, load. FOB, Illinois, 64 cents. So here I am in Twin Falls, Idaho, going to a New York market with a 67 to 69 market, and I'm sitting here hundreds and hundreds of miles with, uh, with transportation costs and have a load of lamb selling Illinois at 64. Do you know what that report did to me the next day? I'll tell you what that $64 report did to me next day. It lowered my market three bucks a hundred. That's what the guy, that kind of marketing report will do. Now, recognizing this inequity, we try to equalize it. NFO has established a national collective bargaining program to deal with this by professionally informing and representing sheep growers in its nationwide communications network and industry contacts. I want to know what's going to happen before it happens. That is the difference between profit and loss not reading about the disaster in the, in the paper. It's getting out of the house before it falls down. It is just as important to know when to sell as when not to sell. And when you have that, that vital, vital information, then you can make a decision. We've taken the Mickey Mouse out of it. We're not flipping a coin and saying, Mother, do we go to town today or wait next week? Okay, to obtain this hotline for its members, engage professional bargainers whose responsibility is to utilize information to negotiate acceptable prices and contracts for grower members. I don't know how many of you have gone to machine shows, but if you took me to a machine show and they start explaining hydraulics and all that sort of thing to me, I need an interpreter. I really don't understand it. The good thing is I do know I don't understand it, so I'll ask somebody that does. That's my salvation. And this is what NFO is trying to provide in this area of marketing and bargaining and information. The power to accomplish this is to organize and assemble sufficient numbers to contract maximum competition in order to negotiate. That's so simple. Just listen to this. The power to accomplish this depends on the ability which is all of you, to organize, which we're doing, a sufficient number of sheep numbers to attract maximum competition. I have buyers calling me every day, and I've got to turn down orders, and that's, that's a sorry thing, but that's what I'm doing. I'm not picking up any more orders. I'm not trying to do something when we haven't got the volume to support it and go out here and disappoint, an or, uh, disappoint him as we've disappointed members in the past. Now, here's a decision. 
And this is not, I just don't basically talk to you folks. I'm, I'm thinking in the perspective of when you sit down and talk across the table and you're sitting in the cafe, sitting at the coffee table at home, or you're sitting in the cafe around. This is where I'm talking to you because basically all of you are here because you recognize this problem and you're here. The ones that don't are the sick ones. You're the veterinarians that are going to go out here and hopefully inject some, some new thinking into these people. Now, the decision that has to be made, do we want to utilize a system designed and operated and administered by growers for grower members for a ma maximum financial benefit to their sheep operations or cattle? Do we want to do that? Is that what we're here for? Do we want to structure a system that's going to give us the money that we've earned and put it in our family's pocket, or are we going to utilize a system that is designed operated and administered by those whose sole aim is to obtain as large a financial share of your sheep operation as possible. Now, I have been a buyer, and as a buyer, I own no sheep. Now, if I expect to get any money off a of sheep, then I must take that money from you. I must, as Devon Woodland says, extract it for my services. What we are trying to pr provide for you in this organization is a service that will allow that to be extracted and to go into your pocket at a fixed cost called checkoff. The decision is your program or theirs. It's that simple. We've owned that's that's a choice. We don't have a whole bunch of things running all over. This program is a very simple program for very complex people. Now, the question must be asked, what is the difference between an NFO representative? Now, there's a big hassle. What's the difference between an NFO rep and a buyer? I'm still called, oh, yeah, the NFO buyer's in town. I am not a buyer. I represent your interests. That is my job, as the buyer represents his interest and his job. My allegiance is to you. His allegiance is to his people. And if he abandons that allegiance, or if he starts giving away the family jewels, and you've got to look at a guy that is not going to be in business very long, or his company is not going to keep him because they can't afford him. In the same token, if I go out and do a lousy job of, admit, of, of negotiating or getting prices for you, who needs, who needs him? That's how simple it is. It's just as much a survival for us marketers and bargainers as it is for you. Now here's an example. We're going to get in to the systems that are now being used. Okay, the seal bid system. All of you are familiar with that. We can go in, everybody sits down, all of you want to buy my product, so put your name in an envelope and how much money you're going to pay me for that and we'll have pretty much like the Emmy Awards, we'll open up the envelopes here and we'll see who gets them. Doesn't have anything to do with cost production, just how much will you give me? That's a sealed bid situation. I'm not putting down the organizations that utilize it because they are utilizing that first super important step. It's collective thinking to at least assemble these lambs and get them into a position where they can be, no matter what system, that's collectively at least assembling them. Auction. We hear a lot about the telephone auction. Oh, this is a big new, a new rabbit for us to chase around. That's just about what it boils down to, another new rabbit for us to chase around the ring. Auction, basically speaking, is a liquidation deal. When any of you people are finally say, hey, we got to get sold out, what do we do? We pick it up and take it to town or hang, when we all finally hang up our gloves, we put a sign on a, somebody's cafe window and says, sale. That's not marketing and that's not bargaining, that is liquidation. Just plain, simple liquidation and a method to weigh, a method to do it. Private treaty. A private treaty means an auction also is very public. I'll know exactly what he bid. I'll know exactly what he bid. I'll know exactly what he bid. Now, everybody will know what everybody bids except me. I got mine in my back pocket, and I throw a few of those out every once in a while as an auctioneer. But basically speaking, it's a pretty public operation. Private treaty. Now, this is a super important area. 
because we went into Huron, South Dakota here, and an old buddy of mine there that I'd traded with for a long time, like little Freddie Mines, I had Tom Blake with me, and we went into the auction ring, and we sat down, and there was a couple phenomena. I said to Tom, and I said, now I want you to watch how many telephone calls he gets. There were 11. I said, well, I want you to watch what happens to this auction. What happens to the auction when the phone rings? When the phone rang, and they said, we want you at the phone, the auction stopped. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you right away that man controls that auction because they can't go on without him. And I asked Tom, who was an NFO rep, I said, Tom, what do you think about those 11 telephone calls? Oh, he says, great, this must be a hot market. I said, it could be hotter than hell, but you'd never know it because the only man that has any information in this room right now is the buyer. All of you are sitting out there. You're all watching. You've been to sales, a ton of them. The only guy that really knows what's really going on is that buyer. Now, I propose to reverse that situation and say, hey, let's, instead of you people giving, when you call up, you never hear from a buyer. All of a sudden, my God, every once or twice a year, when you hear crops ready to come in, how's the kids, how's mama, the pets, the dog gives a bar candy to the kids. Jesus, great to see you again. How many sheep have you got? You'll not only tell him how many sheep you got, you'll tell him how many neighbors you got, how many twins you had. You'll give him more absolutely vital information than you'll give your NFO rep. You're the only people that I know that deliver your game plan before the game. I see John smiling because he knows I'm telling the truth. He's the only people that deliver our game plan before we start the game. Now, if we take this private treaty and you give me that information and the gentleman that's opposing me, now I'm tired of this throwing rocks at buyers and telling them what no good SOBs and all that stuff. That's baloney. He's got his job to do as I have to do mine. The better arm that I am with your information your confidence, your everything, the better job I'm going to be to be able to go out and negotiate a good, sound contract for you. I'm better prepared to go into that negotiation with that guy because I know where you stand, I know what you want to do, you know what I'm going to do, and we're a team. But if I'm going in that negotiation and I'm sitting there and you're thinking, now let me hear what that rep has to say, and the minute he goes to the John, I'm going to run down the hall and get on the phone and see what so-and-so is going to do. Now, if this is the way collective bargaining is going to operate, you people might as well just pick up now and go home because this is the way it's been operating. And it can't, it can't make it, folks. It's just, it just can't make it. There's, it's just that simple. Now, we've got an opportunity here with collective bargaining by taking the collective numbers and collective information that you people have, giving it, and consigning it into one central area, then we can begin to play. We have the cards to play. We're not playing against jokers in the deck and wild cards. We have the cards to play. And we'll play them if we're professionals, and if we're not, then you need to get somebody better than we are. And you don't fool around. You, some of you know fooling around with an old tractor, just about the time that you really need it is when it goes down, and you can't get parts or and you can't get somebody to work on it because everybody else has done the same thing. It's just that simple. So this is the time to be making decisions, not when you're flat up or when you got the lambs in the corral. The toughest, meanest cookie in the whole world is a feeder cattle man or a sheep man with lambs, on the, with lambs and cattle on a hill and it's raining and the grass is growing. Oh, he's mean. Oh, and he's sad that night he's got those lambs in that corral. And the phone hasn't rang. And he said, geez, what are we going to do? It's a sad deal. Because I've had many, many telephone calls. But folks, that's no time to call. The time is to plan for those contingencies. That's what we're talking about here. We can make forward contracts. To give you an example, in California, $75 just before Easter. Three weeks later, 50 cents. Now, you know and I know that it had nothing to do with the American stomach. 
or the American consumer. Had nothing to do with them. But by the time they called me, you know what my analogy was? I said, I feel just like a cow, a, a, a seaboard cowboy going out in a rowboat to lasso the Queen Mary hull down. I couldn't think of anything else but hooking on that big ship and going right down with it. But within three days, three days, One, we start holding meetings, no bigger, smaller than these, but very highly representative because the big growers were there. You'd have eight, ten guys, and you'd have 20,000 lambs. I started to show them how we could begin to work out of this mess. And they told me personally that buyers that had not called them for over two years were on the phone. And you know what they were doing? They were busy quieting the pigeons so the pigeons wouldn't fly because they were shooting as fast as they could and they were, didn't want any pigeons to get away. But we stopped the trend. I would never have believed myself, and this is not NFO rare. Within three days, the growers calmed down, the panic ceased, and we began to get orderly marketing and we began to get price improvement. The problem was that you people, good NFO members, paid for that trip. The problem is this director came back without one damn lamb signed up, one bit of check off to take care of my expenses and costs, which you people pay for. We proved the point, but until a California sheep man makes up his mind, he wants to do what he wants to do. Now I'll tell you how, how, how sometimes it's hard for me. When I got done with that meeting, what happened is they wanted to hire me as a consultant to go out and, and get them a packing plant. True, I tell you this is true. So I called into the home office and I told them what they wanted me to do and I said they'll pay my expenses and I said it'll give me a chance to not only work my program for NFO but it'll give me a chance to enlighten these people. So when I got all said and done my presentation was it would take five million dollars which is not expensive in the packing house business today. And that didn't shock them too much, because these boys got bucks. The shock was for me, because I had the alternate program right over here. You've got to commit, if you're going to own the packing house, you've got to commit the sheep to the packing house. So you're going to have to commit the numbers the same as you would with an NFO supply contract. And I can do all that for a dollar a head. And you don't have to worry about the USDA and air pollution and sewers and water commissions and all that sort of thing, unions, dollar ahead. And we can do the same job. We want to buy a packing house for $5 million. So you see, it's not easy. It's not easy when you're talking to your neighbor. I'm looking at these guys and saying, you know, I'm looking at them. You talk about getting out my veterinarian medicine. And the only thing I would do at this moment in time with those guys if I try to vaccinate them with this kind of an idea is bend my needle. They're going to have to get sicker before they recognize what they've got to do. They need a packing house that will kill 265,000 lambs in six weeks in an impossibility. And then let the rest of the year, let it sit still. There's <laughs> no way. We can future contract out of that. I turn around with the San Luis Valley with no more lambs than the one man of all, all these meetings had. One man could have furnished as much supply as I had out of the San Luis Valley, and I have turned around and sold those lambs basically at a $71 delivered in Denver, which is immaterial, but they're about $15 a head high, as, as high as their lambs were cheap. Now, I'm not any miracle man. No magic, no nothing. Just a plain, ordinary, simple program of having some growers say, hey, we're in trouble. We'll sign the lamb's dick. Go do something and bring it back to us and so we can have a price. That's simple. <laughs> Why in the world we make it so complex, I don't know, but we do. We got, man, we got to figure out some way to throw enough monkey wrenches in. But they, see, these people in San Luis Valley, they've been had time and time and time again. So San Luis Valley people, were not hard to deal with. They have been sick. They've been to the hospital. They've had the priest come in and give them the last blessings. They know what it is to be right up against us. There's no trouble with them. It's that poor devil that's got just enough money or enough credit left in the bank that's still going to go out and sail on his own. Now, the old system, the key word, 
top dollar. By God, I'll tell you one thing. I would much rather take the 69 cents in San Luis Valley when my neighbors are getting 71 than I'd take 55 when, <laughs> in California when my neighbors are getting 50. It's not too hard for me. I just don't have that much pride. I sat in a room with a young farmer in Honeyville, Utah. And when I got done with him, his whole marketing program was to get a quarter more than the Greek on the next mountain. I swear to God, here's a young man that's going to take over 8,000 head of sheep. And his whole attitude of mind was he wanted to get a quarter more than Nick Chernus. And I'll tell you one thing, when I walked out of there, that was scary for me, because if that's what at the future of the sheep business, we haven't got any. Because when I went in the sheep business, there's a great opportunity. When I went in the sheep business, we had 52 million sheep. Today, we got less than 10. And I can stand up here, I'll put you a program together that will make money in the sheep division, that will make money for you. I had a fellow go through, you never saw the contortions he went through yesterday. He told me about all the problems he had with lambing and all the problems he had with transportation, all the problems he had with wool, all the problems he had with, with the feed and where he could go with the lambs. Oh, it was terrible. I asked him one question. Are they making money? Oh, yeah, they're making money. A lot of us are going through those same excruciating exercises and not making money. The simple equation for bargaining power will be just about equally proportioned to the volume that we sign up. One lamb, one <coughs> vote. Ten lambs, ten votes. Ten thousand, ten thousand votes. That's just how simple this program is. Nothing hard about it. Basic factor, the buyer needs to fill his needs. How many times have you people thought about a buyer needing to fill his needs? Not too many times. What's our need? Our need is cost of production plus a reasonable profit. I'm satisfied that I can go to buyers and with reasonable negotiation get that job done. Because as an ex-buyer myself, buying at least a million lambs a year, I had to have at all times on hand at least 40% of my supply. Now don't let this get mystical. Let's say that you've got cows, you've got lambs on feed, and they're eating blank tons of feed a day. Can you wait for a telephone auction to find out if you're going to be the lucky one that gets the bid to feed those sheep? Hell no. You've got to have your feed lined out at least enough in time to give you opportunity to be able to feed them and, and get a greater supply. The packer or any feeder cattle buyer or any lamb buyer is the same. He's got to have so much on hand. I want to be on the front end of the contract, not on the hind quarters. The point, at this point, do you agree enough with the material that's been presented? You really, you really buy this or you just say, hey, we got to know one of those guys up here that's going to give us one of those hell and fire damnation speeches from NFO, or do you, do, you think it, do you think it's worthwhile to continue? And if you do, fine, we'll go on. And those of you that don't say, heck, I'm, I'm wasting my time, again, I say to you, I, 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 I say to anybody that can't sit here with an open mind and say, I don't believe everything this dude says, but he does have a point or two. I have never gone to a meeting. I've listened to hours and hours of talks, and maybe only one lousy line comes out, but it was worth it. And that's all I'm seeing here. I'm going to ask the question now, and it's a super, to me, it's a very super question. The question must be asked, are you qualified to deal on an open market against professional buyers who trade daily, hourly, minutely, when you only try, when you only trade once or twice a year? That's like, you know what that reminds me of, the old films we see when the the traveling boxer comes to town and we got one of the local yokels that's going to get in the ring with that dude that's fighting every day or two or three times a day and he's in pretty good condition. This old boy's a good old strong boy, but no, nowhere matched for this guy because of the fact the guy's trained, the guy's prepared, and the guy is, is in physical condition to do it. That's what we're trying to do and we try to professionally bargain <laughs> with buyers in the field. We just are not in condition to do it. Just a simple fact.
Now we've got, in our situation here, I'm going to go faster here. God, it's getting later now. In our situation here is a contract for sale. That's the first move in our, in our program. Second one is my supply contract. The requirements for the AFO sheep program. And that's read to each grower. So when you sign your name to that contract, if you got any questions, you got anything to ask, that is the time. I do not want anybody in the sheep program that signs up on a sheep contract to ask me a question afterwards. And I want to be clear enough and, and square enough with you people that if we got questions, let's answer them before you sign the contract. That's simple. I don't want second trades in the corral. I don't want amnesia on either side. I don't want the buyer to forget what he told me he was going to do, and I don't want the grower to forget he was supposed to stand them overnight. Or if the sheep get rained on, that's all right. We're going to weigh up, we're going to weigh up the water. I don't want that. One of the things that we got to consider, what's checkoff? Oh, if I haven't heard checkoff, checkoff, checkoff. Let's examine checkoff in, the, in, the, in, our, in our deal, in the sheep deal. One, a third of that goes to the national organization. I'm going to use a dollar a head for sheep. You guys can equate it to cattle. Okay, second goes to the bargaining and marketing. That's my expenses, my salary, my telephone calls, whatever I've got to lay out to get the information and the negotiations that are necessary. That's a third of that dollar, 30 cents to the organization. Now, who's the organization? That's you. So let's say we're going to put some money down the tube. The 30 cents goes to me. So, well, that's Hammond's salary. Okay. The other third goes to the National Farmers Reserve and Indemnification Program. Now, what is a Reserve and Indemnification Program? You're going to go out here in the lobby, and you're going to see it. It's called the trust. And basically what it is, it is an insurance program to guarantee that contract that you sign will be performed upon, and if it is not performed onto the letter, then you in turn will be reimbursed for any way, shape, or form that it is not as long. It is not for a quality situation. It is not to protect you for that runny nose calf or that sick lamb. It is not for that. It is for a contractual violation due to market drops. I have, I'm not going to go into them, it's going to take too long. I have one here of buyer bankruptcy in, California, in, in Kansas with the Kansas Farm Bureau four years ago, 1976, I haven't got it to trial yet. So when somebody says sue me, say go ahead because the only thing you're going to be paying is a lawyer because they never get enough time to ever hear one of those cases, as you know from the dairy deal. We had a market, we sold, we had a meeting, and our people did just what we're talking about with San Luis Valley. We had a meeting, we sold our lambs at 50 and a half. They said, sell them at 50, if you can get it. I sold them at 50 and a half. The market went to 37 cents, and the buyer's banker said, I will, I will, that this kind of loss, he does not have the assets, I withdraw my line of credit. Now that means I've got, that's about the same thing as when somebody comes out and says, write me out a check, and you can write it out, but when it bounces, the guy comes along and says, I've got your check, I want a cashier's check, and you don't have any money, what are, you, what are they going to do? And here we are, we're in the middle of, of a delivery, we got lambs all over the mountains of Colorado, and the banker says, in fact, I got a $75,000 ragged dra bank draft that had passed around so long that it was in tatters. Trucks backed up all over the place. The uh, Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Game, Wildlife, everybody all over our back because we're on the land too long. We resold those lambs at 43 cents. That's $7.50 a head on something in the neighborhood of 25 to 30,000 lambs. It's a $180,000 loss for this organization. Within 10 days, everybody in the organization was paid. NFO's still waiting for their money. You tell me one buyer, you tell me anybody in the business today that gives you that kind of protection, nobody. You've got that in that 30 cents that we pay for reserve and indemnification. 
Let's take a second one. The second one was a situation where we had a uh, bunch of growers that uh, signed their contract. Being half Basque, I can make fun of my own people. Uh, Basco is a very sharp, astute businessman. He's the, uh, the <laughs> Spanish Jewish gentleman. He's sharp, and he knows how to trade. And when you say a price that's high enough, he has no trouble understanding or hearing you. But when that price changes and gets better, he has an awful bad language problem. And when he can come to court, he can hardly understand the judge, would you raise your hand? 